glad, and uh, I'm, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. I encourage you to get out a piece of paper, not just to take notes, but you're going to need a blank sheet of paper. I'm have you do an exercise at the end. It's going to help you break off the spirit of mammon. I believe that's the number one reason why Christians aren't prospering. So as we get started, can we just start off with an admission? Yes, there's been bad teaching on finances in the church in the past. There's also been bad teaching on heaven, and I still plan on going there. Right? There's been bad teaching on grace, and I still plan on receiving it every day of my life. So fear of error is not a reason to ignore truth. If you're ignoring truth, you're already in error, right? So let me give you my definition of prosperity as we, as we get started here. You guys ready for this? Is you have no financial debt. Financial leverage is something different. I'm not going to talk about that. You have no financial debt, and you have more than enough resources to fulfill every divine assignment God has for you and enough left over to help others fulfill theirs. What do you think about that definition? You have no financial debt, and you have more than enough resources to fulfill every divine assignment God has for you and enough left over to help others fulfill theirs. So prosperity doesn't mean that every Christian is going to be a zillionaire, right? If you're a farmer in Uganda, your finances are going to look different than someone who's called to reach the Hollywood elite. Like, which one's better? Well, neither one's better. The idea is we stay in our lane, and God gives us the provision for the vision, right? He gives us the resources to accomplish whatever assignment he has for us in that season. So if you're Joseph in prison in the Bible, abundance for Joseph doesn't mean you've got the finest chariot in the land and a palace on a hill, but it means you're going to have the wisdom, you're going to have the emotional health, you're going to have the favor that got him to appoint to head of all the prisoners and be able to have to complete his assignment in that season. So if God can get money through you, he'll get money to you and there'll be plenty left over for you. That's a powerful thought. I want you to picture a hose. Right? So you are that hose, and the resources are that money that's flowing through. And here's the good news. The inside of a hose gets wet. Right? And so if, you, if God can get money through you, he'll get money to you, and there'll be plenty left over for you. I got some good news. God does not mind meeting your needs in style. Right? His name is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. How are we doing? <clears throat> so um, I grew up in a denomination that was big on giving to missions, and I love that. I love hearing the stories here that you guys, you're, you're, you're a TV station. You're not just putting out word ministry nationally, internationally, but right here in the city. I love that. But um, I would hear stories that went like this from the missionaries. The missionary family, they're out in the mission field. They're broke. They've got no food. They've got no resources. And they would sit at the table, and by faith, they would set the table, knowing that they had no food. They put the plate, the knife, the fork, and they would hold hands and pray. And as they're praying, there'd be a knock at the door. And they would go and answer the door, and there's a family standing there with groceries, and the needs are met. Like, the, we, we need those stories. Like, how many of you heard those kind of stories before, Right. Here's what we need even more is we need people who not only have the resources, but they have the ability to hear from God on where to deploy those resources. That's what I call a kingdom wealth builder. Okay, I believe that's what I'm talking to tonight or today or whatever you're listening to this is a kingdom wealth builder is someone who's turning their dollars into soldiers to accomplish kingdom purposes. I'll tell you what, I really like that definition. Dollars into soldiers to accomplish kingdom purposes. Now, I'm going to give you a 15-second sermon on finances, probably the greatest sign and wonder you've ever seen. A preacher doing a 15-second sermon on finances. Everything I'm going to tell you is true, but it doesn't work for most Christians because of the spirit of mammon. So I'm going to, I'm going to hear, here it is. Ready? Who in here needs more finances? Yeah, preacher, we need more finances. And then begin to talk about how poverty and lack are not God's will. Absolutely true. Begin to talk about sowing and reaping. If you'll sow generously, you'll reap generously. 100% true. The Bible even has that in the context of finances. It talks about you can get a 30, 60, yay, even a 100-fold return in your finances, right? All of that's true, and all of that's in the context of the finances in the Bible. But here's the problem. Um, it's all biblical, and it's all true. Then how come Christians aren't walking in this? Here's the problem. is When you don't have your heart right, it reverses our relationship with God. So now I'm using God to go and get me more money. Here's the deal, guys. He's God. You're his servant, and you're turning those dollars and his soldiers to accomplish kingdom purposes. So the problem is the spirit of mammon comes in, reverses our relationship with God. So let's talk about the spirit of mammon. When you see here the spirit of mammon, don't picture like a demon wrapped around your brain, okay? It's uh, like Ephesians 4 where Paul says you're going to be made new in the spirit of your mind, okay? I believe the spirit of mammon is the number one reason why Christians aren't prospering. If I'm talking too fast, you can just watch it again. I get excited about this topic, okay? And so uh, turn with me to your iPhones in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, and here's from the English Standard Version. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so uh, some of your Bible translations may say God and money, but uh, you'll look in the little footnote there, it'll say it's the word mammon. So what's mammon? Mammon was the demon god of Syria, whose name meant the power of riches. So here's Jesus. He's a brilliant teacher. He's setting up. You can either put your trust in the one true God, or you can put your trust in the spiritual influence behind money. <clears throat> so here's what mammon does. Mammon tries to get you to look to money the way you're supposed to look to the one true God. 
want you to think about this. So if you begin to feel more significant and more secure when you've got more money in your checking account, that's the spirit of mammon because your security and your significance is supposed to come from God himself. Okay? Our security comes from God himself. So here's what I want to do. I want to read you some popular Bible verses, but I want to read you what they sound like when the spirit of mammon gets hold of them. Okay, you guys ready for this? Popular Bible verses, spirit of mammon when it twists it. Here's what it sounds like when the spirit of mammon gives it to you. Where does my help come from? My help comes from money. When I have money, it leaves me beside still waters. Money is an ever-present help in time of need. My people perish for a lack of money. My money shall supply all my needs. A day in the mall is better than thousands elsewhere. Right? And so that's what, uh, behind mammon is this great lie. Like, yeah, God takes care of those super saints, but you're not one of those super saints. So what you need to do is you need to spend a lot of time worrying and fretting, how am I going to get more money? Here's the deal, guys. You don't need more money. You need a greater relationship with the Lord. Here's, uh, here's what it looks like to serve and worship mammon. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, you know, about your body, what you'll put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Hope you guys are sitting down for this one. Are you ready for this? Anxiety and worry are to the spirit of mammon what praise and worship are to the one true God. When you're worrying about money, you're literally bowing your knee to a lesser God and saying, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I can't believe I'm singing on television here. This is, this is, this is my dream. This is my dream is happening here today. I want you guys to get this. Fear is faith in the devil. Okay? Worry is a form of atheism because it's imagining your future without God. Faith is imagining your future with God. I got some super good news for you. God's already in your future. He'll be there when you get there, so you don't need to worry. Okay? I want you guys to get this. God's supernatural cannot flow into fear and worry. It's like heaven's, heaven's blessings are open. Jesus, uh, ever since Jesus paid for it on the cross. Let me, let me just make this. I'm going to go off notes here for a second. I'm going to make a, a strong statement. I'm going to back it up. God would no more rather have you in poverty than he would have you in adultery. He paid for you to come out of both. That's a strong statement. God would no more rather have you in poverty than he would have you in adultery. He paid for you to come out of both. Remember how um, poverty came on earth. It came uh, with uh, thorns and thistles and the sweat of the brow. What did Jesus take on the cross? He took thorns and thistles in his brow and shed blood to break the curse of poverty. Remember, his inaugural ministry said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. What's good news to the poor? You ain't got to be poor anymore. Then he goes on, he says he's going to open blind eyes. He's going to set captives free. And so the, uh, he gives a negative condition. Then he's going to change it. Blind eyes, he's going to open. Captives, he's going to set free. What was the solution to poverty? It was the gospel. It was the good news being preached. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Somehow the gospel of the kingdom has in it the seeds to pull you out of poverty. There is no prosperity gospel, but the gospel of the kingdom includes prosperity. The gospel prospers. How are we doing? Are we okay here so far? All right. Uh, let me make this statement. You don't need more money. You need a greater relationship with the source. Okay, don't, don't ever get this confused. God is the source. Everything else is a resource. Don't confuse the source with the resource. How many of you guys recognize the Old Testament prophets had it rough? Like, oh man. Um, Isaiah had to walk around naked for three years. I'm like, I don't even take my shirt off at the pool anymore. Uh, last time I did, there was threats of some lawsuits from some retinal damage from the glare spots because my body was so white. Um, Hosea was there, asked to marry a prostitute named Gomer. I'm like, her name was Gomer. You should have known things were about to go horribly wrong. My apologies to any Gomers out there. Um, Ezekiel was asked to cook his food over his own dung. Now, that's hilarious when you're in junior high, but when you're an adult, that's completely disgusting, right? You can see why the church has been a nonprofit organization for so long. Um, Elijah, God says, Elijah, I want you to prophesy a famine. He's like, I'm an Old Testament prophet. I love prophesying famines in the land that you're living in. He's like, man, how about we couldn't do it? The Amorites, the parasites, the termites, the cellulites, the mosquito bites. He's like, no, Elijah, in the land that you're living in. He says, don't worry. I got a sweet resource of provision for you. I want you to go to the brook Cherith. Remember that? So he goes there. He's got the water. He's got the Amazon. Now ravens sending him food every day. Everything is going good until the brook dries up. Now, what do most Christians do when the brook dries up? They start freaking out. God's abandoning me. This giving isn't working, right? And so, again, don't confuse the source with the resource. Your resource of provision is going to change many times in your life. Maybe uh, it's your job. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's still your parents. No judgment here. Um, uh, you know, pension, Social Security, whatever it might be. Those are just resources of provision. The source of provision never changes. So he looked to God. Every time the resource of provision changed in Elijah's life, here's the very next verse. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So you may be in a season here where it's like your brook is drying up, where your resource of provision has changed. What do you need to do? You need to get the word of the Lord. So God says, Elijah, I want you to go to the city of Zarephath and find a widow. 
I'm sure he was like, Lord, did you say window? Is there like a window of blessing? No, Elijah, she's a widow. Is widow like the last name of like a Boaz type person? No, Elijah, she's a widow. Why is this strange? Well, there wasn't like a lot of uh, female entrepreneurs on Shark Tank in the ancient Near East. Her resource of provision was her husband. Okay. And so, uh, so he's, he goes there and he says, he goes there and he says, he sees a woman and she's forging through the rubble, trying to find enough sticks to start a fire. Uh, that ain't a good sign in your new resource of provision, right? And so uh, Elijah talks to her and he says, hey, can you get me something to eat? And she says, listen, it's kind of a bad time. Got a little bit of flour, got a little bit of oil. My son and I are going to make one last cake that we might eat of it and then die. Not the mighty faith declaration you're looking for out of your new resource of provision, right? So I'm expecting Elijah to take up an offering for this poor widow, right? Find some people of means in the city. And he does take up an offering for himself, Remember that? He says, bake me a cake as fast as you can, right? Bring me a cake that I might eat of it. Can you just see the newspaper headlines like prophet of God takes last meal from widow, right? Those prophets had it rough. Why is Elijah doing this? Listen, guys, Elijah was not after her, her resources. God was not after her resources. But he knew if he could get her eyes off of the resource and onto the source, supernatural provision could flow into your life. Listen, guys, 99.9999% of preachers are not after your money. What we're trying to do is get your eyes off of the resource and onto the source so supernatural provision can flow into your life. See, the spirit of mammon, um, Elijah knew that the spirit of mammon had already captured her heart. And he knew if he could get her eyes in the right place, things could happen. If you get nothing out of this message, catch this phrase, nobody can take better care of me than dad. Boy, you get that lesson in your heart, it breaks off the spirit of mammon. Nobody can take better care of me than dad because mammon puts this deep fear in your heart. You know, God's not going to take care of you. You got to take care of yourself. You got to get on the internet and start finding all these ways you can make money. Matthew 6 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I got some good news for you. Provision comes to you because God loves you more than birds. <laughs> That's good news. How do most people try to get their needs met? Through sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping is not to get your needs met. If you got a need, sow a seed. Just because it rhymes doesn't mean it supersedes Scripture. How are we doing out there? Okay. Sowing and reaping is to increase your harvest of righteousness. Okay. As believers, we don't give to get. It's way better than that. We give to get so we can give away even more. Your harvest of righteousness in 2 Corinthians 9 was your ability to be generous. So we don't, uh, we don't, we're not trying to, we don't have to perform in order for God to provide. If, uh, if my kids, when they were little, if they came home from school and said, Dad, I gave away 10% of my sandwich at lunch. Can I have dinner? I'd be a horrible father if my kids thought they had to perform in order for me to provide. Okay, here's some good news, guys. Um, a lot of people, they're treating tithe like it's, uh, like it's hush money to the mafia. That if they don't send their tithe in, that God's going to send Guido to break their kneecaps. He's going to send the uh, devourer to eat their crops. Here's some good news. He's God the Father, not the Godfather. Okay, so our giving is to increase our harvest of righteousness. It's not, it says they neither sow nor reap nor store in barns. What do most people do? They're either, they're either trying to manipulate God with the divine slot machines of heaven with their giving. That's the spirit of mammon. Or they're hoarding it. They're, they're, they're storing in barns. They're trying to hoard it. And as a believer, remember, if God can get money through you, he'll get money to you. And there'll be plenty left over for you. Have you ever seen a bird having a panic attack? No, um, but we've seen plenty of people doing that. Why? Because birds have this innate thing on the inside that nobody can take better care of me than dad. When you understand this, you could literally walk into your place of business tomorrow and your boss hands you a pink slip and your blood pressure doesn't even increase because you know nobody can take better care of me than dad. You can step into financial freedom today. You don't have to wait till there's a certain number of zeros in your bank account. You can actually step into financial freedom today when you recognize this. Nobody can take better care of me than dad. So if you remember at the beginning of this broadcast, or the beginning of my time at least, I should get a piece of paper. So if you're just tuning in, I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Go get a blank sheet of paper and something to write with. We're going to do an exercise here. And we're going to break that spirit of mammon off of you. And we see people, they begin, it's, it's like, you know, God's, if, if God's blessings are raining on your life, the spirit of mammon is like an umbrella. It's like that fear and anxiety. God, God can't bless that. So we're going to break it off your life. And I think you're going to see something, uh, something shift in your finances. So get a piece of paper, something to write with, and we're going to go ahead and do that. While you're doing that, I just, uh, I just thought of a story. I have a friend, and he, um, he, uh, he, the Lord has asked him to give away all of his money three different times. Okay? Now listen, if the Lord doesn't ask you to give away your money and you give it all away, you're a bad steward and you will not be rewarded. Okay? So don't hear what I'm not saying. But I want you to hear how free he was. And so, um, so the last time his daughter was in college, and so he's like, you know, they had bills and stuff. And he felt like the Lord said, give away your money again. And he said this. He said... Um, he said, uh, 
He said, when the Lord asked me to do it, I was so excited because I knew I'd have more stories to tell. And can you imagine being that free from the love of money or from, from any kind of tie to money that if the Lord said, give it away, that you, you'd be free to do that. So that wasn't planned. Maybe that was for somebody there. But here's what I want to do. I want to break off the spirit of mammon. And I want to help you experience God as your provider. You know, a lot of people have made him Lord and Savior, but they haven't actually trusted God as provider. And here's my challenge here before we do this. Some of you, your finances might be a little bit of a mess. What if you were to say, you know what, I'm going to make trusting God the most enjoyable thing ever. See, money is just another way to be intimate with Jesus. See, there's biblical principles, but principles without the prince is more like witchcraft than kingdom. It's not just doing these principles out of our willpower. It's doing them in his strength with him. Money is just another way to be intimate with Jesus. So if you're here today or you're listening to this and your finances are a bit of a mess, what if you say, I'm going on an adventure with God. I'm going to make trusting God the most enjoyable thing ever. So to help you do that, let's break off the spirit of mammon here. So you got the piece of paper. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit a question. You're going to say, here's the question. Well, maybe let's do this real quick. Uh, I, got, I got seven minutes left. I'm going to do a quick training on how to hear God's voice. You guys ready for this? I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to say your first, middle, and last name in your mind, not out loud. Okay? When I count to three. First, middle, and last name in your mind, not out loud. One, two, three. Okay, open your eyes. See, when God speaks to you, it's going to sound like you because your spirit and his spirit have been made one spirit. I think a lot of people, they're waiting for God's voice to have a lot more sizzle factor, you know, and they're like, oh, I'm your, I'm your father. You know, like they're waiting for Darth Vader's voice to come shaking or something like that. It's going to sound like your voice because your spirit, well, that's just, that's just me. Well, just you has been united to Christ. You've been made one with the three in one, right? You've been enfolded into Christ like an ingredient in a cookie dough, right? You're the fiance of Jesus. So little old you has the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So when, you're gonna, when you hear God's voice, it's going to sound like you, but it's going to be better than you could think, right? It's going to kind of come out of the blue, or you're going to... Um or you're going to get a word picture. God speaks to people in word pictures. And so I would have you uh, picture your favorite vacation spot, but you might not come back to me here. So as you do this exercise, you're going to get a picture or you're going to get a sudden knowing. You're just going to know it. Remember, it says Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking. That's how God spoke to him, too. All right, here we go. Here's the question with the Holy Spirit. Um, Holy Spirit, what am I worried about that you don't want me to worry about? Okay, that's the question with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what am I worried about? that you don't want me to worry about. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take 30 seconds and I want you to write down the answer on that piece of paper. And we're gonna do something with that piece of paper. No one else is gonna look at it, it's between you and Jesus. Holy Spirit, what am I worried about that you don't want me to worry about? Go. I know you're not supposed to do like dead silence on television here, but uh, I believe the Holy Spirit's working on hearts right now. Here's what we're going to do here. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, cast your cares on Jesus because he cares for you. So we're going to do something. We're going to take up an offering, but we're going to take up an offering of your worries. We're going to give these worries over to God. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer. And we're going to break the spirit of mammon off. We're going to renounce the spirit of mammon. And then when I count to three, you're going to take those pieces of paper and you're going to tear them up. It's going to be like a tear offering. I know it's one of not, not one of the five offerings of Leviticus, but it's going to be powerful. It's actually going to sever that, uh, that, 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 that relationship you had with mammon, trusting mammon, trusting money instead of trusting God. Okay? So here's what I want to do. So get those pieces of paper ready. Some people, when they pray, they like to put, they like to put their hand on their heart because it just reminds them, God, this is coming from my heart. However you're comfortable, here we go. So I'm going to pray the prayer. I'm going to pause so you can pray it. You can uh, respond out loud or you can respond uh, just in silence. Here it goes. Uh, you're praying this. I'm done with the spirit of mammon. Let's just start again. Jesus, I'm done with the spirit of mammon. I'm done worrying and stressing about money. Forgive me for worrying. I'm asking you for a grace for my finances. Not because I deserve it, because of what Jesus paid for. I renounce the spirit of mammon. I'm done looking at money as the source. You are my source, and I declare that nobody can take better care of me than Dad. 
All right, let's get those pieces of paper out and the count of three. I want you to sever that tie and just be done with it in the name of Jesus. One, two, three. I, I just believe that there's a sweet sound in heaven just going up to him there. And so um, let's end with some declarations. So the Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And that you, uh, so we're actually taking our faith and we're using our words. See, uh, faith is voice activated, right? It's you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. You're like, isn't that name it and claim it? No, it's believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. It's actually in the Bible, okay? So here's what I want to do is we want to, say, is we want to take these declarations. Most of these are just right out of scripture. And so we're or using our faith to attach it to words. So I'm going to say it and you repeat it after me. Okay, you guys ready for this? I expect opportunities in favor. God wants me to prosper. In every area of my life, I live in abundance. I am blessed and I'm a blessing. Blessings come upon me and overtake me. I'm not sure, that's right out of Deuteronomy 20. I'm not sure if you've ever been like driving in your little car and like a big truck passes you by and you get like that whoosh feeling. That's the picture of being overtaken. Okay, so let's read Deuteronomy 28 again. Blessings come upon me and overtake me. All my debt is paid in full in Jesus' name. I have the power to create wealth in order to establish God's covenant on earth. I'm a conduit for what God wants to do in this world. And here's the last one. Nobody can take better care of me than Dad. Now, as you guys are watching this, I really hope that touched your heart.